know who to speak to. It didn't work out last time. I wanted to, but the manager shut it down. We didn't have the capacity. It's a not a priority for us at this time. We need to manage the risk around that. We have a draft policy document about that. We couldn't get hold of anybody, they were all at a hui. We only do that when it's appropriate. We don't have the resources to do that. They never agree about what to do. I don't get involved in Māori politics. The dog ate our policy. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it awful? Isn't it awful how many of those lines we've heard? Who, who's heard some of who's not? Well, hands up, who's heard one of those lines? <laughs> if people say them and think we haven't noticed, they were just being quite racist. Yeah. Um, it is mad that I go around talking about stopping institutional racism because it is quite big. But I went and did a talk in the States and they were bewildered that I was talking about stopping racism. Because it was, I spoke at a black cultural centre and, and they thought it was mad because they couldn't imagine a day without racism. And as an ally and as someone that's been involved in social justice activism since I was a teenager, I um, I'm committed to the hope and to the prospect of change. And I don't know how you face the day if you can't imagine a day without racism or you can't imagine stopping it. So I've got madly ambitious plans. We used to talk about a deadline, about we had a particular day that was going to be the day we were going to finish, Stir was going to stop racism within the public health sector in New Zealand. It's, it's September. 2000, it was September 2017, so we've given ourselves an extension because the job's <laughs> not yet over. And I hope that's our last extension. But um, that's the starting point that I think it is possible. You find a corner, you make a start, and you have a crack at it. And you take action from your sphere of influence. We all have a sphere of influence. Mine might be different from yours and yours, but you find your corner and you have a crack at it. Um, this is my family. Um, the ones with the stars are my granddads or my great granddads. Mm. It's all about the men in this picture apparently. And um, it's from 1938, my dad was born that year, my mum the year after. And um, it was inevitable that my mum and dad would meet. As with many Pākehā families, we're highly competitive people. <laughs> mad, we're very keen, and we're very keen on our sport, me perhaps less so than some of the other family members, but we're mad keen on sport and we're very competitive, but the blessings my family, my Pākehā family taught me about fair play. So it matters that you win, but it matters more how you played the game. And it would be a great disgrace to our family if you played badly or cheated or did something wrong. So blessings for that useful bit, because there's other more complex bits about being the descendant of one of the colonisers. And as in the madness of contemporary Pākehā styles, my goddaughter is Ngāpui, my, un my nieces and nephews are Ngāti Whātua and Ngāti Maniapoto, and my new grandchildren, <laughs> we nearly weds, my new grandchildren are um, Ngāti Kahanunu. So that is the face of contemporary Pākehā families in New Zealand. That love is changing the face of some of the race relations in our country and within the next 20 years we'll be much browner than we are now. And, and the place of Pākehā will be displaced by new New Zealanders and by the growing Māori and Pacific population. But that's a long wait and we're wanting action faster than that. But anti-racism work for me is very personal, as well as being a professional, ethical bottom line. So for me, Te Tritia Waitangi is the terms and conditions by which my ancestors came to New Zealand. 
So they are the rules of engagement. And it makes it, I, I feel very lucky that we have such a document because it gives us direction and a steer about how to behave and what to do. And it's been disappointing in the 170 something years since its signing, the number of times that our government has breached Te Tiriti. And people are a little bit excited about the change of government in our, in our country at the moment because it's gone a little left. And my research shows there's no difference in terms of the amount of institutional racism regardless of who's in government, so I'm not celebrating that. The current government, in the pre when they were previously in power, were part of the largest confiscation of Māori land in my lifetime. So we will see what the days ahead bring for us. This is a little snapshot of colonisation. The disappearing land. The people getting locked up in prison. And the, in 1867, the banning of te reo in schools. Any one of those, locking people up in prison and losing your land and losing your language, is devastating on the health and well-being of people. It didn't work out well. This is... Um, special um, graph that I don't know, Robert will have seen before that shows the loss of land in Māori population. You guys, I believe, did some genocide here. We did genocide also in New Zealand. So don't believe the folk that say that we didn't. If you want to read more about Māori health, it's exciting, there's so many health people here. Um, these are two of the great places to read about, about Māori health in the context of New Zealand. Mason's textbook is the most cited piece of Māori literature in um, all, of all of health policy. It's a great basic te text to get your hand around what Māori health. And this other one um, from the Urupo Māori Centre tracks what's happening in terms of the disparities and kind of contextualises that and you can get that free online, that one you'll have to buy to get it probably, but it's the cracking box if you want to read more. This year is the 50th anniversary of the, of the coining of the term institutional racism and that's the conference I'm going to tomorrow. And I use this slide 90% of the time so I ever do a talk and I'm sure you can read it from your spot, but it's just really powerful about how it explains what institutional racism is. So, so it's about action and inaction. It's about those big policies. It's more than the people in the system. It's those systems and practices that you guys will have all seen, the racism, I'm sure, firsthand in the systems here. Racism looks different in different places. Australian in here, and my understanding of my, my, my occasional visits to Australia, you do racism differently than we do at home. In, in New Zealand, we do racism against, against Māori, against indigenous people by being fiercely monocultural and we squash out anything that doesn't fit. So when you try and engage with an institution and you're not Pākehā, you're not white, you get squished. And so this is from the, the, the big report that first exposed institutional racism in New Zealand. There was other reports before this and there's been other ones afterwards. This is the most important in terms of social policy and the recommendations are still as relevant today as they were in 1988. So those of you that have been around a while, a while all of my work will be familiar because it's all work recycled from the 1980s. Because it's cyclical and I haven't had any original contributions yet. There's Irahapiti. Irahapiti is the, is the godmother of cultural safety, and I always like to put her up. And there's our mates, oh, self-promoting um, AUT, and our trusty co-author is here who helped with this. What, what were your chapters? Ethics and uh, migrant and refugee community. Wow, oh, that's a must-buy in neighbourhood um, bookshop. <laughs> I should be commissioned. 
All right. So that's kind of looking at what it looks like at the moment in kind of contemporary New Zealand, which is kind of an interesting resource. But it's great. I, I, you know, I always feel proud that cultural safety came from New Zealand and we began to think more about you need to know who you are in order to engage with others and being aware of your power. And I, you know, and always go back to Uraha Piti and her vision for the shifting and power of resources to Indigenous people within the health system, which is the substance, I think, of what she was talking about. But people often go to other places in relation to her work. And her PhD is online and a valuable read. Um, this is a bit of my PhD. This is a very defensive slide. It's very defensive because um, I, as an activist scholar, people are suspicious about my work, and when you see the outrageous things I say, you might get why people would be suspicious. So normally when people triangulate their data, I kind of <coughs> did more than triangulate. <coughs> I used a whole lot of different methods to find out how institutional racism was operating and how we made policy and how we did funding in New Zealand in the public health sector. Anyway, it was a mixture of all those fabulous methodologies. And this is what my, my um, the crew that I worked with um, all agreed to be named essentially in my PhD, which was just a blessing. So this is my mate Grant talking about the relationship between Māori and the Crown. On a regular day, it wasn't a particularly difficult day, this is a regular day. Heather, I was going to say, um, Any time. do you think um, you might be able to share your slides? You're like welcome to have the slides. I was just thinking in case people are trying to madly write anything down. No, no, no need to madly write, you can have the slides. And Grant, blessings, last month got named Public Health Champion in New Zealand, which is the biggest public health award you can win, so our mate just won it in recognition of his lifetime contribution to Mighty Health. So it's this difficult relationship. If this was a marriage, you would leave this marriage. To be clear, you would not be going back to get battered again. So this is 